last session of the day. Um, thanks so much for sticking around. It's the last session that separates you from enjoying some food and drinks at our reception later. So um, bear with me uh, just for a little bit more. Um, yeah, what a fantastic day um, it has been with all these super interesting presentations and fascinating discussions. Um, we heard about the power of stories, um, about the importance of knowing your audience. Um, we talked about the importance of testing and evaluation. And we looked at change and went from the individual level uh, to change in institutions. Um, so in this session, we really want to tie together all the different things that we learned throughout the day, all the different takeaway messages that came up in the individual sessions. Um, so I want to spend just a few minutes um, to talk about our little video competition. Um, so you voted, um, and the Piano Stairs video won by your vote. Um, the actual winner of the competition was actually the speed camera lottery. Um, anyway, so all of these videos, I think, um, kind of found in a catchy and fun kind of way to talk about behavior change. Um, and I just wanted to, without going into a lot of detail on each of the individual videos, I just wanted to get some reactions. Um, it was presented as the fun theory. We can change behavior by making it fun to change behavior. Um, and I just wanted to get maybe two or three really brief, quick comments. Do you think that works? Um, do you think it doesn't work? If not, why not? Anyone have a reaction? Yeah, please. I think that it Go to the mic. <laughs> sustainability of it, right? Okay, great, thank you. Um, all right, so for the next uh, part of the session, I want to invite the moderators of our afternoon uh, breakout sessions to give just a brief overview of what the main topics of discussions were, maybe give a little background on what you did in your session. Um, what was the main takeaway? Um, what approach to behavior change um, that you discussed during your session was found to work best? And what approach was found to not work? And then in the discussion, I hope we can kind of find common elements between the different sectors, or maybe find that there needs to be a different approach for each. Um, so, um, yeah, how about we start over there, and then work our way down. Is this on? Oh, it is. Hi. I'm Laura Fordyce. I was actually not the moderator, but sort of co-organizer with the awesome moderator that was Louise Howe. Oh, she's back there. 
So we were in the health behavior, kind of titled Motivating Behavior Change in Public Health. Um, and we had three very fascinating speakers who were sort of focusing on three different topics. One was M Health and the sort of sort of digital world as it intersects with health right now, behavior change. Uh, the use of tobacco and sort of the change over the, the century and especially with the move towards e-cigarettes. And then HIV risk behavior. And um, I apologize, I didn't totally focus on the questions. And I would have to say, I'll just give the disclaimer, I don't know that we really discussed so much what didn't work, um, but instead I'm gonna sort of talk about some of the important themes because I think a lot of them really tied into stuff that was talked about all day. And so I think that that it was a really interesting um, session that really sort of reinforced things that we've been talking about all day. Um, one of the things I think that came up throughout the three talks was the need for theory. And this is particularly important when you're talking about interventions, right? So that we're not just creating interventions out of the space of nowhere, but that these interventions are created based on theoretical ideas, behavioral models, things like that. Um, and, you know, as an anthropologist, this was, of course, very important to me, and I was glad to see it come up throughout the day in each of these talks, is the need for site-specific, tailored, and contextual interventions, right? So these, these interventions, what works great here, is probably not gonna work the same here. And so that's where theory, where your research, where your context becomes very key in understanding these, these interventions. And that sometimes they may, be, may need to be adapted. And I think there was a great example came up in sort of one of the last comments when we were talking about, Louise asked a really interesting question of Dave Abrams, who's at the Legacy Foundation about the Truth Campaign, right? The Truth Campaign was used to convince adolescents that smoking was bad. And he said, you know, we had a lot of success with that campaign, but we're realizing now what worked in the late 90s and the early 2000s is not gonna work with the younger millennial generation. So we're actually already retailoring it retooling it, you know, using focus groups, doing research to think about how we're going to shift the message to make it effective. Um, what I also thought was really interesting that came out of these three talks is the need for very creative solutions. So these especially are looking at um, big data, the use of computer modeling, um, <coughs> the use of sort of digital footprints is what um, Wendy Nielsen was calling it, the fact that we're all so tethered to our phones and that because of that, it's all this data is tied to that, right? And so what can we use with this data? Um, there's a lot of issues with privacy and things like that, but how do we get people to sort of understand that this data can be, you know, de-identified and useful for different sort of strategies and understanding health behavior? Um, and one of the things that's really important to me is uh, transdisciplinary work. I mean, that came up in each of the talks, how important it is to de-silo how our discussions, we need to learn how to translate across different disciplines, we need to communicate. Almost in every case, they were talking about examples where you had computer scientists working with behavioral scientists, working with social scientists, and epidemiologists, and those are the successful interventions, right? The ones who are using sort of a transdisciplinary team to sort of create an intervention that, and, and also gets you know, community stakeholders involved too. Um, so yeah, sort of coming up with a common language, thinking about how you can work together, um, and sort of coming up with creative solutions that involve modeling and computer science and big data, fun stuff like that. So I'll sum it up there. Hey, hello, I'm Laura Adams, and I organized and moderated a panel on Countering Violent Extremism, which is our sort of foreign policy panel at the Behavior Change Conference. And um, the idea of the panel was to take um, actually critical approaches to countering violent extremism. The US government right now is, um, has a budget of about $188 million invested in what is called CBE programming. Um, and it was the focus of a major summit that took place at the White House, organized by the White House this year. So countering violent extremism, it, well, is a sort of drop in the bucket when you're looking at changing behaviors compared to health behaviors, for example. It's still um, something that is a, a very timely topic for discussion. But I think it's, it's sort of interesting, uh, Lauren was saying that you didn't talk about what not to do, and, 
basically that was a lot of what we talked about. <laughs> what, what doesn't work? Um, in part because, um, as, as Peter Mandeville pointed out, he's from the State Department, and it was refreshingly uh, critical for participant on US government programs. Um, violent extremism is an extremely fuzzy object to target for behavior change interventions. Um, and as we talked about earlier in the day in several different occasions, uh, successful behavior change interventions need to have a specific behavior that they're targeting in order to be successful. And if you, if you look at um, anything that's been generated um, this year, um, trying to lay out official policies and guidelines and programs and policy uh, priorities, uh, what you get are very long documents with many, many bullet points. Uh, violent extremism is not a behavior <laughs> that is able to be targeted. Um, and so we, we don't necessarily have a lot of information. Um, at, there's, there's not a lot of research behavioral sciences research to help us understand what to target. And, and, and as Peter pointed out, perhaps we don't even really know what it is we're targeting. We're targeting. We want people to stop being bad guys. Um, and that's not a behavior. The other point um, that came out of this discussion that is, is more of an institutional point, which is um, we, are a, we have a hammer and we're looking for nails to hit um, in terms of the US government's policies. This shows up in, um, in a critique that's come out in the New York Times and the Washington Post, two separate exposés in the last month of the State Department's counter-messaging campaigns. Um, and the public diplomacy department at State you know, is, is spending money on, um, on counter-messaging strategies, but they don't have any idea if any of this works. And in fact, most people say it does not work. Um, and that we, we, don't, we don't know what we're doing, and that messaging coming from the US government is, is actually counterproductive. Um, the other way that we, um, that there are some things that are not nails that we can't hit with our hammer um, is, is that the importance of religion and values that we talked about earlier in the day today and that people are very motivated by morality and, and ideas about who they are, and in this case perhaps who they are as, as a Muslim person. Um, and that the US government is not equipped and in some cases legally prohibited from um, intervening with it with religion and values. And then, of course, the, the thing that came out session after session, I think, is the importance of understanding that behaviors come from individuals who are thinking and making decisions, and that human beings uh, are operating in systems of complexity, and that the idea that we could somehow come up with a set of behavior change tools that will apply to all people in all situations is probably fallacious. And what we really need to do is understand how humans in this situation are making sense of their choices and figure out how to tailor those interventions, which I think speaks to the importance of social science as the appropriate uh, method, you know, has, has the appropriate methods to approach this, but it's certainly not something that, um, that makes it in efficient and inexpensive to fund through go government programming and interventions. So another point is that, that even when we do have um, interventions that are trying to target ex violent extremism, um, we don't know if they're working, and often there are effects, but they're more related to peace building or development kinds of effects. And that development programming has all sorts of, of uh, beneficial effects, um, some of which may contribute to um, countering violent extremism, but it's hard to know. Um, and then one thing that hasn't come up, at least in the sessions that I've attended, um, are, is, is the importance of social networks and how networks mobilize individuals to action. And we had a very interesting um, uh, empirical point made um, by our, our, one of our panelists who's been doing a lot of work in Afghanistan, Casey Johnson, about um, the ideas that uh, radicalization is not the same thing as mobilization. It's not a linear process. People can become radicalized but not mobilized, or they may become mobilized or demobilized for reasons that have nothing to do with ideology. Um, and that we really need to understand actions and not just ideologies. Um, all right, so that, I'll stop because I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs>
So I'm Nada Petrovic. Um, I was the moderator for the Environment and Sustainability panel. Um, and this was a particularly interesting panel, I think, because behavior change is already so difficult, even when the individual benefit is really clear, so health issues or eating right. But it's even so much more difficult when it comes to the environment, um, because the benefits are less clear, they're distant in space and time, they're uncertain, they're evolving. And a lot of these themes um, came up in our panel, really thinking about both behavior and then these changing, uncertain environments that we're trying to think about. Um, and the overarching question of our panel was, uh, when it comes to environmental sustainability, what are the motivators of behavioral change? Um, and how does that work for individuals, communities, and large-scale populations? Um, and so I think the two themes that really came out for me um, were the importance of individual needs. And in the case of the environment, there's sort of a spatial analog. And so there was a lot of conversation about the local and what that means and what local knowledge is in different situations and how it relates to climate change and disasters. Um, and also there's this issue of individual empowerment and how that can link to collective action and then how that is further related to environmental issues. So I'll just give a little snapshot of each of the panels, um, of each of, of some takeaways from each of the speakers um, and, and how they tie into these two themes that I mentioned. Um, so the first, the first um, speaker was talking all about climate change um, and how to motivate change around this. Um, and one of the big issues there is that the primary needs that were discussed early are often um, really in contradiction with climate change. I mean, climate change is rarely going to be a primary need. And so how do you work around that? Um, and additionally, we are in the, we're embedded in an invisible system of beliefs and motivations, and we really want to um, defend that system. So this is, um, this is a situation where, for example, people might under-report temperature because they don't want to believe in climate change because it undermines how they, uh, their way of life, the reliance on fossil fuels, how that links to larger beliefs about um, politics and so forth. And so there's this, um, in order to create motivation there, it's really important to create system justifications and how does that, and how can we align system justifications with the environment? Um, and, and I think the, in the, morning, in the morning, the conversation around religion and, the, and stewardship of the environment is the way to kind of, to kind of do that. Um, and then we had a really fascinating, very applied talk about FEMA's Preparathon work, which is um, helping people um, prepare for a variety of natural disasters, how can they have the tools, and and so on. And this is where the specific needs theme really came into play, because moving away from an all hazards approach and focusing on specific risks. So really trying to make it local. What are people in particular locations actually worried about, and then allowing them to have the information that they need, and that creates um, that creates motivation more easily. Um, and, and additionally, the theme of empowerment came out, um, this idea of self-efficacy. Um, so giving people confidence that they're able to prepare um, and that, that, think that this will work for them and therefore empowering them to engage. Um, and finally, we had a really interesting um, talk about uh, communities in the Arctic. And they're, so this is a very local situation and they're definitely seeing climate change um, impact their lives. And so here, um, it's, it's not about convincing them, but it is empowering them with knowledge of how their local experience relates to larger processes. And actually, there was also a conversation about their local knowledge feeding back into our global process um, and, and sort of a two-way empowerment, which I think is really interesting and important. And finally, there were some, there were some, there, there were some conversations around institutional change and how institutional change is necessary to empower communities. And a really nice ending note where um, the idea of empowering individuals in order to um, create institutional change came up. And there was a, this example from FEMA where we don't have one plan that's coming from on high. Each individual has a plan and that creates a community plan and that builds into an institutional plan. I just thought that was a nice way to kind of tie all of these different themes together. Um, so that was the, the environment. Good afternoon. I'm Frances Carter Johnson, um, AAAS Fellow at the National Institutes of Health, and I was the chair and moderator for the session on best practices to reduce institutional bias. So how did that session play out? We had two speakers for 15 minutes, 
and we did a case study on an example of um, institutional bias or an example that had several institutional biases in the systems in a federal agency um, actual example. But our two speakers, our first speaker was uh, Dr. Keisha Thomas from the University of Georgia. She provided an organizational and uh, organizational psychology perspective on what institutional bias is. She's a professor in the psychology department, but she is also an associate dean for diversity and inclusion at the University of Georgia. So she brings both a scholarly background and a pr practitioner background to her work in dealing with diversity resistance and developing diverse organizations because she actually practices this work within a university setting. So uh, she talked a lot, she gave us the definition and gave us an overview of what institutional biases are. And in her definition, and there was research to support this, there are policies and laws that can systematically affect certain subpopulations more than others. For example, she talked a lot about human resource and hiring practices that are based on networking, which we're all very familiar with. The get, getting the job depends on your network. And, um, but sometimes they, you tend to not focus on skills and abilities, but focus on the network only. She also talked a, a little bit about um, different aspects of hiring, mentoring, how not all, um, not all representatives, not all populations get the same type of mentoring and the impact that that has on hiring and on networking. So she presented, she presented several factors that relate to human resources and human and organizations that can lead to institutional biases. In our next speaker was Lisa Evans from the National Institutes of Health. She's NIH's Scientific Diversity Workforce Officer for, for the Office of Extramural Research and for the NIH Director. And before being at NIH, she also worked in the Department of Justice, HHS, and NASA. In the Department of Justice, she, she actually litigated um, cases that dealt with present day school desegregation. If any of you are familiar with the Ayers case in Mississippi, um, that's similar to the Maryland um, desegregation case for colleges, she litigated those specific cases. So she was able to provide exact examples for us, um, not from higher education desegregation, but from uh, an elementary school in Minnesota with the native population where the elementary school was 60% native population, but the students in the gifted and talented program, only 20% of those were from the native population, and they were the majority in the school. So a case was sent to the Department of Justice, and they didn't have to litigate this case. Um, they presented the case to the school district. They brought in experts to conduct research about the evaluation criteria for entering the gifted and talented program. Eventually, they found that there were cultural differences that led to um, the students, native students, not being recognized as gifted and talented because of the way they were raised. So that provided a really good example for us. Um, a case, uh, there was a report that was brought, but they didn't actually have to sue or take the, the um, school district to court because the school district believed the evidence and worked with them to rectify the problem. In terms of common theme, themes, I think we really saw how selection, um, whether it be human resources selection or selecting into gifted and talented programs or any programs that we're accustomed to, how common selection processes or status quo, pro status quo, quo selection processes might have inherent biases built into them. So the point was to really begin to think critically about these selection processes and, and really may potentially reevaluate. And because our case study also dealt with a selection case for an intern in the federal government, we addressed that or the groups that we broke into small groups and the groups really talked about that a lot. What didn't work or what doesn't work for reducing institutional biases, especially as it relates to race or any other um, non-privileged group is taking a colorblind or pretending that the problem or the group does not exist. So in the case that Dr. Thomas presented to us, multiculturalism was a lot more effective than colorblindness. Um, so in, in any case, if it's multiculturalism, if it's race or 
uh, cultural backgrounds, really recognizing the differences and beginning to value those differences and determine how you can incorporate those differences into selection processes. Um, poor planning, they thought, and was a problem that leads to problems in, in uh, selection. So we always want to be, whether, whether you be a member, uh, you always want to be intentional in, in your selection if you want to reduce institutional biases and lead to behavior change in that area. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for these really excellent summaries of um, the sessions today. Um, so now I'd like to turn it over to the audience um, and give you all the chance to ask any additional questions, maybe raise points that haven't been talked about before today. So you'll have to excuse me if my voice shakes a little bit. I'm absolutely terrified standing here saying this, but I have to say it. The, I was in the session on diversity. I do a lot of work around diversity and inclusion and unconscious bias and microaggressions and micro inequalities and how that shows up. And I heard one just now, and I want to point it out. And I don't want to do it in an accusatory way, but I want to make it really clear that this is how this happens and that if people sit in silence when it happens, it will continue to happen. I want us to be very, very wary of equating violence that hides behind a veneer of religion with the practice and beliefs of that religion. Violent extremism has nothing to do with the practice of Islam. It's the start of Ramadan. And I would really like us to show a little respect for the people who walk their talk in that religion. Can you imagine what it's like to go without food, or water from sunrise to sunset at the time of the summer solstice. There are people who practice that religion who are as good as any Christian, Hindu, Jew, or other pr religious practitioner you've met. And to hear that equated with violent extremism upsets me terribly. We have to be really, really careful how we couch these conversations. Yeah, thank you for this really important um, topic. Bawa, do you want to respond? Would you, would you care to specify what you heard? I heard you say violent extremism, and then in the same sentence, honestly, it fried my brain so that I can't remember exactly what you said. Okay. But you said something about the, the, the ideals and values of the Muslims being tied to violent extremism. That, that this conversation around religious ideals and beliefs has to do with how we counter violent extremism. Okay, well, I, let me just clarify what the, um, the link between religion and CVE was in the discussion. Okay. Um, because I certainly wouldn't intend that to be the link. Um, the link is that um, in talking about countering violent extremism, um, the, a lot of the discussion um, in terms of the US government's conversations about this is about um, how do we uh, promote a, um, a different understanding of Islam? How do we support um, main, what they call mainstream clerics in, in talking about Islam um, as opposed to um, people like Al-Qaeda and, uh, and Taliban that have an extremist view of Islam. And as, as um, CBE practitioners would say, twist Islam um, to violent purposes. So that, the connection would be how does, you know, if the US government sees, um, in, it sees radical interpretations of Islam as driving violence in, in certain contexts, how does the U.S. government promote uh, other uh, and, and, and get get disseminate other views, other other views of Islam, other interpretations of Islam in the public spheres, where in order to counter these extremist versions? So, the U.S. government, of course, and, and my the point coming out of the discussion is that the U.S. government is is pretty bad at talking about religion, <laughs> and in some cases is prohibited 
from, from doing programming that, that touches on religion. So this idea that one of the drivers of violent extremism is a particular kind of extremist Islam that needs to be countered with a moderate or mainstream Islam, that that's something the US government is not good at dealing with. So that's, that's what I intended to convey. Okay, I hope that clarifies your concern a bit. Um, yeah, you, maybe you can connect during the reception um, and, and talk about this further. Any other uh, questions or comments from the audience? Anything, anything else? Anyone else have an immediate comment or question? Um, if not, I wanted to ask the panelists um, to reflect a little more. Some of you touched on this in your summary, but maybe you could um, elaborate on this a little bit. Um, what do you think what works or what doesn't work in your particular field um, linked back to the theories um, and the concepts of marketing, um, which we learned about this morning in the morning sessions. Do you want to um, yeah, whoever wants to start, feel free to jump in. I mean, I, I think I've brought up some of this stuff already. I think that, um, you know, again, understanding local context, not just targeting individuals, but realizing, which I think each of the moderators have brought up, that individuals are part of a larger system, that we have communities, that we have um, you know, institutions, that we have nations, we have all these other different influences on, on behavior. So it's not just about getting an individual person to decide to make a change, that there's a lot of complexity to this. Um, so yeah, I think that that tied in very well to some of the earlier discussions. It came out very clear in the discussions about health. Clearly about the discussions. So uh, Dr. Wilson's overall, the keynote speaker this morning, talked a lot about um, stories, but not stories in the, in the sense of anecdotal evidence, but a story in terms of understanding the situation from a social science perspective, really understanding what the problem is and using that story to design your that, your, that understanding to design effective interventions to test those interventions. So that was really, um, that was important even for the, it was important in the institutional bias um, session because they talked about stories, but they talked about the data that um, supports these stories. And then what do you do once you understand that data, whether you work in a university environment or whether you work in the federal government, when you understand the story and the context of how selection processes are not being fair, then what are the next steps? So the, the next steps often in the federal government and in a practitioner um, standpoint are to first speak up and to identify um, what, where the issue might not be coming from might be coming from, and to make a culture, to create a culture within these organizations where it's okay to speak up. So there are some cultural changes that need to happen uh, as you're defining the problem. But have the research and do the research and, and be able to present that research to motivate the needs of the agency or the organization where you're identifying the bias. And then work with your institutional resources to produce the processes, the policies, the organizational change, and the behavior change that you need, that you want to produce. So I think I, um, I t discussed a fair amount just this idea of specific needs, and that really plays out in the context of the environment, um, and particularly with disasters and with, and with climate change and how it's affecting particular communities. And maybe just to get a little more specific, there was also a really interesting conversation around how people perceive risk. Um, and with natural disasters, this is 
uh, it's, it's a complex issue, issue, complex issue that relates to timing and probability and maybe you haven't experienced disaster even though they are really quite common in your particular area and how all of that plays into it. And what doesn't work is giving people probabilities and numbers um, without contextualizing it with their own experience. Um, and I think storytelling also comes in there in terms of people um, for example, survivors can be trusted messengers because they can tell the story of their particular experience and bring it home um, as to what, what has happened to them and then uh, make preparedness seem more relevant um, uh, in, your, in your case. I guess I would say um, one takeaway, I think, is that we need to be careful of when we're trying to boil things down and talk about what works and what doesn't work. Um, because I think a lot of the um, a lot of the things that speakers told us today is that uh, you know the human beings are not driven by some sort of our, our behavior is not driven by universal laws that can be distilled and and you know replicated for all people in all times and that uh, what what we really need is some very subtle understandings that will not necessarily generate um, generalizations and, and, and replicability from context to context that we need to understand how identities motivate behaviors how values and concrete social relationships motivate behavior. And these are all very contextual things that um, trying to come up with a sort of set of best practices that we can transport and easily implement in programs is perhaps a Sisyphean task that uh, instead we need to um, always remember, for example, to pretest our messages, right? <laughs> and not take our own perspectives as, as, um, as scientists as being uh, the all-seeing and all-knowing, but instead have, have um, a reality check and really try to understand the particular meaning-making that these particular people are making in this particular situation. Yeah, that was actually a great transition to my next question <laughs> <laughs> of the importance of um, uh, being nuanced and not just um, painting with a broad brush to what works, what doesn't work, but understanding what works when and why and for what people um, so I wanted to actually ask, were there any surprising or unexpected lessons that you took away from, from your um, discussion this afternoon, something that you didn't know before, or that you think maybe a lot of people um, don't know and that you want to share with the audience? Well, maybe there was nothing surprising, but maybe you already knew everything. Can't so. be. Can't be. <laughs> um, okay. Page to Okay. Did, did anyone in the audience learn anything? Yeah. Surprising. <laughs> 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 I don't have a question that's kind of related to that. Go ahead. Okay. So you can go ahead. I hope you come in line. I always, I always come up with this crazy philosophical questions because my mind is always all over the place. But, <laughs> um, okay, so a lot of people say, and a lot of the experts agree, I work with climate change, so um, one of the main issues with climate change is that it's far ahead. It's not going to happen to me. It's, I'm not feeling it right now. So it's very hard to change the behavior of people and they're not feeling it. So it becomes this thing that's kind of virtual, it's kind of how do you touch it? I would argue that being alive and being healthy is one of the most important personal needs. <laughs> Why is it so hard to change behavior when it's related to your own health? We saw with HIV, we see it with smoking. I mean, HIV, the people, it's an immediate, right? The immediate thing. It's, you get it and you don't know if you're going to live or not. The tobacco, oh, I'm going to smoke, maybe I'll get cancer. Or maybe not, but it's it's just so it, it's surprising to me. I mean, how how these things kind of you know get so spread out. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Nanette. <laughs> I can speak to this point. <laughs> Would that be useful? You want to come on? Come on. Sorry, I can't help it. I'm all over the place always, so that's great. I love the example of people who drive and text. So if you ever ask them, 
before they got into their car, you know, do you think it's a good idea to risk your life so to send a text message? Certainly everybody will say no. And then the phone vibrates or rings or whatever, and you're going somewhere, and you think it's you know, a message about what you should get along the way or whatever, and so you take out the phone and you look. So the, the, I think the conclusion I reach from this is, you know, in their spare time, people think, but the rest of the time, people respond to their circumstances. And we don't have a lot of spare time, <laughs> you know, generally. And so I think that's why we really have to think about what are people actually responding to. So when people light up a cigarette, they're responding to a craving, right? And a need, an underlying need, which led them to start smoking in the first place. Or when people engage in unhealthy sexual behaviors, that's because they're meeting other needs and desires that are more salient for them at that moment. So it's kind of like we're like a landscape, just like you have a geographical landscape where some things are really far off and you know that California is over there. Do you know that famous New Yorker cartoon? That <laughs> East, East, like New Yorker. I am actually a person from New York City. I've lived there most of my life. So it's like, yeah, I can like draw the skyline, you know, for you or whatever. Yeah, and then there's like Jersey and Midwest and something California with some nice mountains. So I mean, it's the same thing for our internal landscape. There's the stuff that's right up in front of your face in the moment, and that's what drives your behavior. And then there's all these other considerations. So to the extent that you are a healthy and vibrant person, you're, that, you're not striving for that, you've got it. You know what I mean? You're striving for the really local um, issue that's bugging you in the moment that you'd like to resolve or something you want or whatever. So. Um, so, but you hit upon the most important thing, is how do we take these long-term issues and bring them into our scope of decision-making in the radar. moment? What's that? Put it on the radar. Exactly. How do we, how do we make the long-term salient in the moment? And that's kind of our task as people who work with behaviors, is to think about how to structure, we call it choice architecture sometimes. How do you create the right architecture for somebody's decision making so that the right decisions are the ones that are kind of in their scope of momentary attention and such. So, right, sorry, I have to jump in. <laughs> Flash flood warning. How, um, how fitting since we're talking about climate change. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Serena. Um, Janetta, you had a comment or a question? a question? It's kind of related because I think one of the things about behavior change and doing interventions about behavior change is the balance between the resources that you have. I mean, we can talk about theories all day and like these are elaborate models. And I was just wondering if, if the balance between resource and actually doing great science that we can apply, like, uh, like discuss in your panel, or do you have any thoughts about um, how we can approach it. And I think you know, that's one of the driver of thinking about choice architecture and all the behavior, behavioral economics studies that, that becomes very popular these days because they are really neat, they are really quick, um, they are you know, less expensive to do, but at the same time, you know, we might not be taking into consideration of these bigger models. So I'm just kind of wondering, that there's always this tension between having the right res amount of resource and doing the right work. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of throwing it out there and. Audience, please also <laughs> chime in. So I actually work in ethics, and uh, so what the question of whether I'm allowed to change behaviors is even stronger than you have in a number of uh, other fields. I mean, obviously, when you're working on HIV, the question of whether, you, whether it's a good idea to change behaviours is probably simpler than when you think whether it's a good idea, for instance, to make people work longer. Mm -hmm. And you might think that maybe it's not a good idea to make people work longer. And then, you know, I work for an organisation that is trying to um, end uh, world poverty. So maybe working longer is a good idea from a the ethical point of view. Uh, and uh, I think actually, I, it's not really a question, it's more a comment. I think by making changes, by changing the behaviours and the attitudes of people, we will have to build an ethics of change. And we will have to ask ourselves how far we can go with that 
what are the techniques that are ethical, what are the techniques that are not. To give you an idea, if you have a change, for, for instance, let's take cigarettes. If by lying to people, you could stop them smoke from smoking, would you do it? Any I'm responses? Not okay. <laughs> I'm just the representative. <laughs> I didn't speak about that. Okay. Does anyone want to respond to that from your panel's perspective? Well, I just maybe wanted to just make the comment of there are ethics of change, of change, but there's also the ethics of the current system and whether and, and winners and losers in the current system. And so thinking, so it's not necessarily a, a, a morally neutral ground to not change. So I think it, it's sort of thinking about that and then just bringing it back to the idea of empowerment and bringing in stakeholders to create that ethics with you rather than us sitting here and deciding. No, and I think that was something that came up in a talk earlier today, which I think was really important about being reflexive about who we are that want the change and where is that idea for change coming from and so just sort of again working with communities and is it just because we think it's better for them or is this because this is something they want to change or we want to change actually i thought those were two excellent responses but my question was is i think yes we're all talking about here about change for good but you know you could also use these same techniques for evil change and they have been used in history as well I don't have a question, but in the interest of some of the changes that we're trying to implement, namely that people don't ignore alerts, I want to let everyone in the audience know the reason why you've been hearing buzzing <laughs> is because many people have no weather system alerts mm -hmm. on their phones, and they're going off because there is a severe flood warning for this area until 7 o'clock, and we're advised to avoid low-lying areas. <laughs> Thank you. Was the, was the announcement more specific? Did it say what part of DC? <laughs> As we prepare to travel. Between Falls Church and Arlington. Between Falls Church and Arlington. Arlington and Falls Church. It's the rains in Lorain County. They are moving here, so the rain is already in Lorain County. Every rain. Fall that water's coming down. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> So I wanted to commend the special interest group for putting this on today. One thing I've learned, I didn't uh, get to attend this morning and I regret that because everything I've heard this afternoon suggested this has been a very productive day. I'm an anthropologist, I worked at USAID, a former fellow, I currently work for USAID contracts partly on behavior change issues around HIV AIDS and school health. I, I think this is terrific, and I, one of the things I've learned is that there's a real constituency of people who are concerned about the importance of social science for behavior change communication, and I, I commend the group for putting this together today, and I hope you'll do more things like this, and I, I congratulations to all of you. And I Thank you. <laughs> Lindley, Janetta, and you guys can point out the other people. I mean, they worked tirelessly on this for months. And also, Kristen and Eddie were really, really helpful, too. Yeah. And um, many of these women sitting up here as well, and Louise. So um, thank you guys so much. I mean, you did never drop the ball. They were, I got those base camp updates every day. <laughs> and there was usually someone responding to something. So yeah. it, was, it was very, uh, it was very impressive. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Um, if there are no more really pressing, urgent comments or questions, uh, maybe the flash flood warnings are giving me a sign to wrap this up. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, I also wanted to um, say thank you one more time to all the organizers, everyone who helped to make this happen, especially Kristen and Eddie, of course. Um, um, And of course, all of our speakers who really gave excellent and fascinating presentations throughout the day. Um, it's really wonderful. 
Um, and yeah, as Lauren said, we, we had been talking about this for such a long time, um, probably since we started the group, we wanted to do this, and it's so exciting to see um, it finally come together, and, and thank you all for participating in it. Um,